Thank you and welcome. So today we will be talking and hopefully uh, having a dialogue, not just a monologue, about this book uh, called Philosophical Health. So as you can see from the cover, the first thing that we noticed is that there is not enough space to write philosophical, right? So they had to cut philosophy in two. And I think that's a nice metaphor for the world we live in. There's not enough space, sometimes, we feel, for philosophy in our lives, in our professions, in our practices. And I think that's not a good thing. I think philosophy, from the beginning, was thought as something that helps us in our practices, in our ways of life, and not just um, a, an exercise of contemplation, which it also is, of course. So that would be the first definition of philosophical health that I would give. It is about the attunement, the coherence, the resonance between our thoughts, our values, our worldview, and our actions, our practices, uh, the way we do what we do. Now, a question that might arise is, why health? Of course, most of you remember the um, Greek expression, healthy mind in a health healthy body, or sometimes the opposite, or the other way around, healthy body with a health, healthy mind. So I think the, the Greeks, who are sometimes considered as uh, the uh, inventors or discoverers of Western philosophy, because there are uh, different kinds of uh, ways of knowing that we could call philosophy across the world. But for the Greeks, this aspect of health was very important. But of course, by combining these two words, we're already qualifying them. Health qualifies philosophy as something that is active in the way we embody the world. But philosophy qualifies health in the sense that, well, we are probably not simply talking about physical health, and we are not simply talking about psychological health. And you know these two constructs. Imagine we were in uh, the early 18th century, and we would be in the library, much like this one, and I would be perhaps lecturing on physical health. And that would be really new. If I say physical health for all in the early 18th century, that would be a new idea. Why? Because the idea of practicing uh, gymnastics, for example, for the sake of uh, a, a, a healthier body uh, in itself was the uh, privilege of an elite, aristocratic elite, right? Imagine now that we are in the same library, 100 years later, early 19th century, and I'll be lecturing about psychological health. And that would be also a new idea, psychological health for all. Well, because psychology was more or less invented as, a, as an approach as a scientist at the end of the 18th century, but also because it was in the beginning this idea of psychological health, it was the privilege of some happy few, or if you prefer, unhappy few, uh, if we are thinking about, for example, the people who visited Freud were not always the, the most joyful people we could know. And here I am, uh, 100 years later, yeah, I'm traveling. Uh, that's one of the privileges. If you read this book, you'll be able to travel in time. Uh, speaking to you about philosophical health for all. And that's a new idea. That's a new idea because uh, 
just as physical health for all in the early 18th century and psychological health for all in the early 19th century. Today, we might think and we might argue that philosophical health is still the privilege of certain happy few. Why? Well, the reasons can be economical, the reasons can be uh, political. Let's say they are political, for example. We are in Finland. Uh, can anyone tell me uh, at what age humans born in Finland uh, officially discover philosophy in school, if they do. In France, uh, a country that is uh, reputed for being uh, philosophical, it is only in the last year of uh, the uh, high school, gymnasium, that people discover philosophy. I would assume it's more or less the same here. So that's a political reason why uh, philosophical health uh, is for an elite, because uh, we, the governments, don't find it necessary or important to tell human beings in the first 20 years that there's something called uh, philosophy that might be useful, for example, to not only think critically, uh, but think in concepts. And this is very important, why? Because I would argue that we live in a very emotional society, anti-intellectualist, and we live in a society that uh, has been known for being polarized. And polarization goes a lot with emo an emotional treatment of reality rather than conceptual treatment. You would tell me, yes, but philosophers, they use concepts and they are arguing uh, all the time. Perhaps. I think they are arguing in a, in a kind of polite way, I would say, uh, if not always, but m most of the time. The other reason why I think philosophical health is still a new idea uh, is that Philosophy still has that reputation of being a practice that is not useful, a practice that is even is uh, suspect of being um, an, uh, in, indulged upon by people who are qualified as losers in a society that tends to separate humans between winners and losers. So. When I uh, decided to study philosophy when I was my 18-year-old, 90s, uh, 20s, uh, people thought that there must be something wrong with me. Right? If you want to study philosophy, you, you have a mental issue. Uh, I always uh, I, I discovered philosophy as a discipline quite late, as a matter of fact. And it immediately it enchanted me as being something very <coughs> practical, in fact, as something that helps us engage in the world meaningfully, especially in a time that it, where we are uh, submerged by choices, right? So we could say, okay, maybe 400 years ago, uh, with all the social determinism and... and and perhaps uh, less entertainment and technology than comfort. The problem was not so much about choosing a life, but rather uh, accepting or not the life that was uh, somehow uh, written uh, very often for us in, in most social classes. But today I see a lot of, uh, as a philosophical practitioner and counselor, I see a lot of young people come to me, and less young, and they feel that they have too many choices. And sometimes at 40 or 45 or 50, people are still keeping the choices in the air 
because they are potentials, right? And thinking, well, in fact, I can still be this, be that, or in, people think of themselves in terms of status, right? In terms of possibilities that would necessarily be uh, actualized if they, if, if simply they want it. So another reason why I think philosophical health is um, a new idea, but I would then argue that it's a new old idea, of course, um, it's because we are living now in the extremes. So we were talking about COVID uh, a few minutes before I started, and after COVID, like after a war, etc., people say, okay, now uh, maybe we can um, go back to normal. But I think there's no return to normal. I think that we have entered a moment of uh, the human and the earth history where we now live in the extremes. And is that bad? Well, for some... Uh, for example, ecological reasons. That's worrying. But I would argue that actually living the extremes is the very essence of life that we had forgotten in times of comfort, in times of sleepwalking. This is a very Nietzschean idea. And this is how I decided to call uh, this new field. And again, it's in a way, it's an old field because that's what Greek philosophy and, and uh, Roman philosophy was about. And, and I think many wisdom practices in the world uh, consider philosophy as, as or the questioning of the ultimate truth as something that has a function, a social function. But I call it health remembering my dear... Um, philosopher uh, Nietzsche, who was dear to me when I was a teenager, like many teenagers, so as you can see, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a cliche, right? But uh, Nietzsche is an important figure when you discover philosophy because he, he has this freedom of thinking. He has also the capacity to interrogate concepts that seem familiar and give them another shape. And so Nietzsche had this idea of the great health. And for him, the great health was this capacity to live in the extremes and, and yet do it joyfully, do it meaningfully, and be still a world former. Of course, we need worlds, we need societies, we need to, to have rules, but in a way that is ever creative and that is always questioning the... Uh, rigidity that we might fall into, the dogmas that we might fall into. And so Nietzsche and actually um, the German language has this term Vollkraftigkeit which is more than health. It's in English would say haleness perhaps or, or vigor. And so they had these three moments. Yes, we can be sick and ill. And then in the middle when we are okay, we are healthy. But the real state that Nietzsche, and, but even Leibniz before, and I speak about Leibniz later, we're thinking of is this great health where we are in the full uh, capacity of our domain of possibility and our capacity to create the best possible life, not only for us, but uh, for the others that shared the world we're living in. Uh, in French, élan. Yeah. Yes, so that's an interesting word in French, élan vital, right? And I think you're right. I think in French it would be uh, the élan. Yeah, that's very, that's very well put. And uh, that reminds us of Bergson's philosophy. Uh, Bergson uh, was a very, is not so well known uh, today, Henri Bergson, he had a Nobel Prize, it was very, he was the superstar of philosophy 100 years ago, and he had this view, very Nietzschean also, 
uh, that at the source of life there is this uh, ever-going creation of infinite possibilities. And what we do as humans, we, d we don't create much. Uh, there is this superabundance is there, often invisible. But what we do is that we shape, we tailor, and we, we sort of uh, give rules to this profusion. And, what, and that is called intelligence for Bergson. And the problem is that after a while, we think that these labels and, and these ways of cutting reality into, into certain shapes, we think that's reality itself. And we forget that we have named it, we have divided it such way, but we could have done it in another way. Uh, so, the subtitle of this book is thinking as a way of healing. And that's a little bit provocative. Uh, because some people might read it as borderline new agey. But we don't need to go that far in the sense that we know, for example, when there is a natural catastrophe, uh, we know that after that, uh, for example, I don't know, Hurricane Katrina or even COVID, uh, after that and during that, people engage much more in meaning making, in, in sense making, in, in uh, this sort of cooperation that sometimes is forgotten in times of conflict, in trying to take the possibles that are still there, which might be covered by fear or panic or, or simply catastrophe itself and rearrange them and see, well, we can still make a world uh, with the resources we have. So this is very, I think, important today because uh, we observe. We were talking about, for example, uh, young people teenagers. We observe today that they are very, there is a crisis of motivation among many teenagers who are in high school. They are given all the possibilities. We're talking, for example, we don't need to go very far. We're talking about the Nordics, for example, where we live. Uh, teachers have a very hard time getting teenagers to be motivated. And Sometimes we wonder why, and I've been discussing this, and I'm working with a school called Philosophiska, who has the courage to uh, teach philosophy along with a normal program from kindergarten. And uh, they told me the very same thing. They, they said, I think most teenagers are not motivated because they don't see meaning. They don't see a higher purpose in this world. Some people say that we are the first civilization that doesn't have a shared cosmology. Unless you want to consider that um, making money, as much money as possible uh, by uh, competing with my neighbor, if that's a cosmology, Perhaps if we consider that the universe is, is in constant competition uh, of parts between themselves, uh, survival of the fetus. But uh, that even that is not shared, right? Adam Smith, with his invisible hand, wanted uh, this view to be shared, but no. So we don't have really a shared cosmology. And I think that, in a way, I'm not advocating a universal dogma. I think diversity is good, and I think we've, we're still exploring that today. We've been, let's say, until the uh, French Revolution, very fascinated by oneness, represented sometimes by the king, and, and, uh, and then the democratic experience, which is still very young, uh, has been more and more fascinated by the idea of diversity and pluralism. 
And I think now we're realizing, well, we've gone too far in that because we've forgotten oneness. So I think now the challenge, and this is another challenge, I think, for philosophically healthy societies is to rebuild oneness in diversity to rebuild a shared cosmology that, yes, respects the fact that there might be different worldviews, different uh, ways of life, forms of life, but not to the point that we would believe that just having communities that are constantly yelling at them themselves would sort of self-regulate. And there is a theory today uh, called uh, agonistic pluralism, uh, or is it pluralistic agonism? I never know. But the idea is that we shouldn't try to have deliberation, and we shouldn't try to have people dialogue with each other from different um, epistemic tribes, uh, communities of knowledge. We should simply let them yell at each other, and that's democracy, because it's actually good, because then no one group will take over. And that's uh, Chantal Mouffe, who is a French-Belgian philosopher who famously proposed that idea that uh, uh, we should simply uh, favor that agonism between communities without trying to uh, create a, a sort of meta discourse that would rationalize uh, all that or propose some form of universal cons consensus or agreement. Uh, the problem with that, Chantal, Chantal Mouffe, M O U F F E. And the problem with that is that, well, I think that's a sort of a socialist or, or, or postmodern version of what Adam Smith already said, like the invisible hand applied to communities. And the discourse that comes with that is very often that, and the media are very good at that, saying that, oh, they're good communities and they're bad communities. They're the nice communities. They're so cute. And I'm not going to name drop. I know you want me to, but I won't. And then they're the bad communities. Ooh. I think this is, this is naive. I think that by definition, and I wrote another book called Ensemblance about the uh, intellectual history of Esprit de Corps, about this loyalty to groups from the 18th century to now. And one of the things I became very convinced of is that every community will tend to expand. Every um, group that has a, a strong belief whatever it is, will have a natural tendency to think that everyone should be like them. And there's no exception to that. There's no uh, nice community that, of course, there are some people that are a little bit more violent than others. And, but at the end of the day, that's what a, a esprit de corps is, is trying to, is having such faith in what we believe uh, in that community that we actually think that's normal. And those who are, it's the us against them, right? Those who are outside, they just don't understand. It's normal to be this or that or that. So, this is why I think philosophical health has that hint of universalism that has not been very popular, let's say, in the last... Uh, decades of postmodernism, but I think inevitably that's what we do. We universalize all the time. That's what I meant by, by communities expanding, is that they tend to apply their categories in universalizing terms. And that's because this is how we think. To think, and I think to philosophize, is of course seeing differences, but it's trying to, to think about the whole. Philosophy is the care of the whole. It's a very simple definition that I propose. 
Uh, it allows us to distinguish between philosophy and other practices who care for a part of the world, right? Uh, medicine cares for a part, which is our body. Um, engineering cares for another part, which is building things, machines. Philosophy is the care for the whole, and therefore it is sometimes mocked as being very unproductive with the parts. But someone needs to care for the whole, and what happens is that today, because we've become global and because we have this global uh, crisis, famous climate crisis, but also I think a, a, uh, a political crisis of, of, of lack of shared cosmology, I think the care for the whole becomes something actually very uh, important in practical terms. Now to do justice to this book, uh, I should say it's an anthology, so I gathered people from uh, uh, different traditions, uh, academic traditions, but also uh, geographical uh, locations, and I asked them to uh, tap into their own knowledge and practices and research to see what what would it mean in terms of philosophical help? I had a few articles published, so they had something to build upon. Um, but I, I was surprised to see that uh, the, the frame uh, that I proposed, and I can tell you more about that, for example, what are, the, according to me, the five principles of philosophical health, etc. But let's say this very general frame of of adequation between our practices and our uh, concepts and this care for the whole uh, was inspiring uh, really a, a real interdisciplinary uh, conversation. So this is where I rest a bit from my um, improvisation by uh, giving you an idea uh, of uh, what kind of chapters we have. However, I'm happy to make a pause here if you have questions or comments in regarding this first part of my talk. Otherwise, I'll give you an idea of the uh, contents of the book. So the book is divided in three parts. The self, the others, and the world. And so, in itself, that's part of the manifesto, because I do think that philosophical health is not only about self-development. So, this is not stoicism, right? I, I build this sort of armor and distance uh, from the world, which is, by the way, a, a very simplified version of stoicism. Stoicism is, is more rich and complex. But so, the self is important. Of course, we want to cultivate ourselves. We want to uh, perhaps even approach what the Greeks called theosis, this becoming closer to, to divine principles. But we want also to be in the world with the others, or even if we don't want, we have to, right? So uh, as care for the others, philosophical health has something to say. And then, because we tend to be still today very anthropocentric in our uh, explanations. As a footnote here, I've, I've been working a lot with um, computer scientists in, a, in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. And today, even at the level of uh, the European uh, politics, they consider it very progressive to say, oh, AI is going to be human-centric. Oh, we are so modern and progressive. But human-centric, uh, that's anthropocentrism. And we know, we, we, we know since the 40s or, or even before that it's not a good thing for the destiny of the Earth to have anthropocentric practices. So that's why the part three is, a, is about the world. And I think that uh, a, a, um, a healthy view of um, our 
systems and the way we interact with different ecosystems needs not to be ecocentric, but perhaps uh, hearth-centred or as I, as I write, creel-centred. So creel for me is a creative reel, a little bit like Bergson uh, had this, or, or Whitehead or all process philosophers have this idea of creation at the source of everything there is, not as something that would be typically human. So the world is the third part of the book. And now let me go into uh, the details of uh, the chapters, give you just a brief idea of this first uh, anthology, um, which is very explorative, right? That's the, the beautiful uh, adventure of it is that um, it is it is not necessarily a new idea, philosophical health, but it's a new phrase. And we academics, we, we, we like phrases because they allow us to define a domain of possibility and then see, okay, what does that do in terms of conceptual engineering, but also in terms of possibilities of practices. And the, the book, uh, The Part on the Self, opens uh, with a chapter by uh, Eugenia Gorlin called Living for Real, Not Counterfeit, Self-Honesty as a Foundation for Philosophical Help. So she's a psychologist uh, and she explores this idea of self-honesty uh, and confronts it with some um, ideas uh, that I proposed before on Philosophical Health and she says, well, we have to start with being honest with ourselves, which is not always easy, right? But at least it's something we can, we can do uh, with a certain ev economy of means. It's a little bit uh, a, a sort of a, an analogon to Descartes' cogito, right? I think, therefore I am. So Descartes said, okay, he said, okay, let, let's be honest with myself and try to reconsider philosophy from where I am with, with, with what I have. No books, no references. Just trying to, to be honest with how things might appear. The second chapter by Lehel Balog is uh, called Existential Phenomenological Approaches in Psychiatry and Psychotherapy to the Idea of Philosophical Health. So that's an important chapter of, say, intellectual history. So it looks at how in the um, psychotherapy practices, some uh, people, Viktor Frankl, for example, uh, have tried to separate themselves from the tendency of, of the psychological approach to be very normative and very obsessed by uh, measurements and to put back the person in the center uh, and uh, so this is important because we see that there is a tendency uh, in psychology in psychological movements to start as a rediscovery of philosophy Freud uh, who, uh, for his you know the famous division between the uh, the uh, id, the ego, and the superego was actually very much inspired by Plato uh, in, uh, in various, uh, not only the Republic, but I think also the Timius, the, the division of the soul between desire and, and knowledge, etc., the noose. I will not enter into that, but when we fast forward uh, 50, 60 years, uh, we see cognitive behavioral therapy with uh, Ellis, I think Albert Ellis, and he, he also sort of rediscovered Greek philosophy, the Stoics, etc. But very slowly also, like with psychoanalysis, over the decades, the approach becomes very normative. So, separates itself from philosophy and wants to be a science. And then what we have is that we have practitioners who when someone sits in front of them, instead of entering into deep listening, 
they are, they might be listening, but they are also, they have these grids uh, that they want to apply uh, that are uh, given by their, um, by their field. The third chapter is by Michael Laughlin, uh, and uh, so in terms of geography, uh, uh, Genia is in the States, Lehel is in Japan, Michael is in the UK, and he, he writes about mechanisms, organisms, and persons, philosophical health, and person-centered care. So as you can see, each of these articles, like, I mean, I or preferably the author could speak also for one hour, uh, this is about how in healthcare today uh, some, there are some attempts to take into consideration the singularity of the person. And for Michael, well, that's precisely what philosophical health can help us do. Uh, and he, of course he explains in, in detail how and why and, and I've worked with him and I've worked in healthcare and if time allows, I, I will explain how I have devised a semi-structure method that allows precisely that um, by uh, thinking about the bodily sense, the sense of self, all the way to the philosophical uh, sense to get to know or to help the person have a more explicit view of their philosophy of life. Does that mean that we all have a philosophy of life, a systematic uh, view that, uh, a la Hegel, no, but we can uh, certainly progress in the clarification of why we do things and if we have a purpose, for example. A and I mean by that not just goals, but a real uh, higher purpose, wh which doesn't need to be religious. Speaking of uh, this border between, uh, we were here more in the frontier between psychology and philosophy, right? Now, the next chapter is the border between religion and philosophy with a, a, um, a text by Balaganapati Devarakonda from India who writes about samatha or the state of equanimity as philosophical health, a perspective from the Bhagavad Gita. The uh, chapter on the, s on the self, and this is interesting because we, we tried in a book to bring other views uh, other than Western, and we see that in fact philosophical health as an intention uh, uh, is practiced in many traditions. The last chapter of the part on the self is called Logical Constructivism in Philosophical Health, by Eliot D. Cohen. So Eliot D. Cohen is one of the key figures of uh, philosophical counseling in the uh, USA. And he has a very logical base approach. He thinks that if we think more logically, we'll live better. And that's certainly one of the aspects of philosophical health. Because sometimes we carry huge contradictions that we don't even see, right? Uh, let me give you an example. As someone kindly reaches for a glass of water, perhaps, uh, the example would be the following. Thank you very much. Because uh, I'm, I'm, if I want to endure uh, another 40 minutes, I need to drink a bit of water. One day, uh, so as I told you, I am a philosophical counselor, and um, I. So I help people make sense of their lives. And um, I have this man, 52 years old, um, Russian, who reaches to me and says, I feel lonely. And I feel lonely and, um, and I would like to have a wife, I would like to have children, but I don't. And so here he expresses a a form of idealism, he speaks about love. Let's, let's call it idealism, right? Not that I believe that love doesn't exist, but uh, you will understand why I call it idealism. It's to contrast better with what he then tells me. He explains that, well, uh, when he tries to seduce a woman, it's usually a married woman, 
And uh, he thinks anyway women only go, only are interested in rich guys uh, who have a nice car and who dress well. So we can s say that this worldview is one that we could qualify of cynicism. And so, and here I'm not even judging. I'm just comparing the two and saying, well, if someone carries both a, an idealist uh, intention and a cynical intention, this is going to be a disaster. And of course, you're going to be lonely. So here I'm not even judging. I, I told him, actually, I told him, well, either you go, you, uh, you embody your idealism and, and you really start believing in love and therefore you don't put yourself in relationships that you know by definition will deny uh, that. Or, if you want to be a cynic, be a coherent cynic. I don't know, buy a nice car, a second hand, uh, one suit that looks great and, and go ahead. But, and that's, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not making fun of him because we all like that, right? We all have this contradiction. I think this is what philosophy, uh, philosophical, thank you very much, that was really kind, uh, tries to solve. So, uh, we enter now the um, second part of the book on uh, the others. So, uh, we all, you, I don't know if people still remember Jean-Paul Sartre, he used to be famous, right? And he famously said, um, well, hell is the others, or, or the, uh, the others is the, right. And, uh, and uh, of course, we can identify with that, right? But uh, hell is supposed to be a place where you go after you die. But the others are here when you're alive. So it's perhaps even worse than hell, I don't know. But uh, more seriously, I think that um, there is an importance in philosophical health, philosophical counseling, philosophical care in helping us live together. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but it starts with the others as humans, right? But then there are the others as animals, the others as ideas, the others as uh, entities that we might or might not identify. But here, this part is more human. So for example, the first chapter by Laura McMahon is about the virtue of vulnerability. Uh, Merleau-Ponty and Minukin on the boundaries of personal identity. And so here we move slowly from the personal to the, to, to the family as a sort of first uh, group of interaction uh, that allows us sometimes to analyze things better than if we think only in personal terms. Uh, Raja Rosenhagen follows with a chapter on philosophical health Nonviolent just communication and epistemic justice. So you might have heard of this concept of epistemic injustice. One way of explaining it from within philosophical health is the following. When I um, conducted interviews with people living with spinal cord injury, I did this in two times. The first time, it was a sort of a a phenomenological approach that was based on the intention to know if some kind of philosophy of life had helped these people uh, thrive because I interviewed people who had uh, a tetraplegic condition, who have a tetraplegic condition, but who have a good life and their community uh, identifies themselves as having a good life. And, and, and um, so I was trying to find, well, maybe there is a reason that is not just willpower or, or, or some physical reason, their body is 95% paralyzed. They have to reinvent themselves after the trauma. And, uh, and by the way, they, they all um, had a very high sense of the possible. Well, we'll come back to that. But um, what I meant here is that when I started the first set of interviews, I was very direct. I was like, okay, so What's the most important thing for you in life? What's your philosophy of life? And of course, there is some epistemic injustice in talking to people like that because not everyone has the time or, or capacity to indulge in philosophical thinking. So 
uh, people are a bit intimidated. It's like a bit like taking people on a, with a helicopter to on top of Mount Everest. And then, of course, you might need to breathe, so then you go down. So I thought, okay, we need a way of talking about philosophical health with people that is more gentle, that goes progressively. And that's how I, I came up with the SMILE method. Uh, SMILE PH, that's an acronym uh, for sense-making interviews looking at elements of philosophical health. So if that's something that I apply now in my counseling, uh, we would have a session where we talk about your bodily sense. And usually everyone can say something about their body and the progression in time of their perception of their body. And uh, Then we would talk about your sense of self. And this is semi-structured, so it's very open. You can say whatever you want uh, as long as you, you play the game of n in that uh, part speaking about the self. Then we move to the sense of belonging. And then, after that, the sense of the possible, which is, by the way, uh, the way I define health philosophically, the sense of the possible. If you have a high sense of the possible, you're healthy. You might be 95% paralyzed, but if you have a high sense of the possible and you make things, you're healthy. If you are filthy rich and bored and depressed and, uh, and cynical and don't know what to do with your life, your life is empty, you are not healthy although you can, you can do a lot with your money. After that comes, we would talk about uh, the sense of purpose. And I would say this is where we enter the human sphere, sense of purpose, and then the philosophical sense, the worldview. Because I believe that um, we share the first four with all living beings. All living beings have some kind of sense, a bodily sense, of course, but even sense of self. Uh, a tree has a sense of the possible. If you block its growth in a way, it will, it, it, it will sense things su such that it grows another way. Uh, so, the uh, importance of purpose is specifically human, I think. And uh, this, the, the next chapter talks about that, about meaning, from a hermeneutic approach, a uh, chapter by Dennis Schutzer called Philosophical Health, Meaning, and the Role of the Other, a hermeneutic approach. The following chapter by uh, Richard Civil, who is in South Africa, is about Ubuntu. Uh, some of you might have heard of Ubuntu, an Afro-communitarian Afro approach to philosophical counseling and health, which uh, emphasizes the, the fact that, well, before we can say I am, we should say we are, because we are predetermined, for example, by a collective language and by all sorts of networks that facilitated our emergence in, in the world as, as an individual. So for th from the point of view of the Ubuntu, the individual is an epiphenomenon of the collective. While sometimes where our cap capitalist approach is looks like it's the opposite, right? We have this narrative of the hero who uh, saves the world by making rockets land back. The next chapter by Andrei Simonescu Panait is um, called What is Like to Counsel Like a Philosopher, a Phenomenological Reading of Philosophical Health. So here he, 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 he takes Hussle, Hussle uh, which he uses in his counseling and looks at um, how some things that have been written before on philosophical health, uh, for example, about um, uh, deep orientation, the fact that we uh, uh, might be, um, might have a better life if we follow a higher principle, uh, that of course is not, was not uh, forced upon us, but that we have chosen deliberatively. By the way, regarding that, there is a, a growing so-called science of purpose. If you type science of purpose on Google, you will see that uh, there are a lot of studies now that show that people who have a higher purpose have all sorts of benefits. It's like an Alibaba cavern of benefits, like the immune system uh, is much better. You live 10 years longer. You don't have Alzheimer. 
uh, check this out. I, now I feel a little bit like a charlatan from <laughs> the 19th century, right? Buy this book and you will live 10 years longer. The next chapter is uh, a chapter I wrote on artificial intelligence and philosophical health from analytics to creolytics where I distinguish three forms of intelligence. Analytic intelligence, which is the kind of intelligence that uh, AI um, is good at. Dialectic intelligence, which, which is both about uh, seeing oppositions and, and, and trying to um, overcome them in synthesis. Uh, but, it, but also creolactic intelligence, which is for me the relationship we have with the sublime and how we make sense of things that are not necessarily known yet. So it has a, a creative um, function. Or, or more, or to say better, creative resource. So, we enter now the third part uh, of the, the book, the world. So, I think this is important because one of my dear uh, philosophers lately, more in the last um, years, is Leibniz. And some of you have heard of Leibniz. He was both a mathematician, philosopher, engineer, librarian, um, and many other things. And he had this idea that we live in worlds, and worlds are sets of possibilities that are compossible. So if you have uh, situations that are extremely contradictory, they might be such to the point that they are uh, incompossible, and they cannot be part of the same world. Let's take the example of that man who was both idealistic and cynical. He was borderline, but his world was very depleted because his set of values and beliefs were not compossible. So he was really hanging by a, a little thread, right, on life. Uh, and, and so Leibniz was ridiculed by Voltaire, unfairly so, by in Candide, famous Candide, uh, uh, but Leibniz is insistent on the best of possible worlds. He was a mathematician. He saw that, that he saw that as an optimization problem. He said, "Well, well, if God exists, what God is doing, or that sort of principle that creates some sort of coherence between things, and we cannot deny that there is coherence." I mean, I've been, although I'm slowly decohering because I've been talking for one hour, I'm still here standing as, as, as one. So there are principles of composition in the world. And he said, well, God, if God is the name of the, the movement that tries to optimize all these possibilities into, into a super world. And uh, he, he saw this as something dynamic, and he saw this, I think, I mean, at least this is how I want to reintroduce his idea of compossible uh, today as the sort of, for me, um, the, the ultimate vision of philosophical health, a compossible world. We've been, uh, if you listen to politicians, for example, they talk a lot about the possible. Right. And we've lived three uh, centuries in which we have, I think we could call them the centuries of the possible. We've been extremely good at this form of consciousness that focuses really hard on one part of the world and comes up with a great invention. And then, oh, oops, it broke the world from another side. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad, of course, that's creativity, right? The sense of the possible. But what we need today is to evolve to something even more difficult, is to have a sense of the compossible. That is, how do these possibles that we bring forth into the world can be harmonized uh, at the level of uh, the world that we call Earth and beyond? So uh, that's why a, chapter, a part on the world was important. 
The first chapter, I think, for those of you who are academics, uh, it's a treat. It's called Professionalization and Philosophical Ill Health Maladies and Councils. And that's a very amusing, fierce, but unfortunately very true critique of academia today and how it doesn't, uh, it's not always a very philosophically healthy place, apart from the Turku Institute for Advanced Studies, of course. Um, this is followed by a chapter by um, Abdullah Basaran, who is in Turkey, and uh, who writes about philosophical health and the transformative power of storytelling. So this is about bibliotherapy, and, and uh, as a philosophical counselor, I sometimes very often give people a text to read between sessions. Uh, I even have actually, speaking about AI, uh, I believe that AI should help us, not replace us. And one thing that, um, for example, we could do, when I, it, let's say I have a 45 minute sessions with one of you, I usually write keywords. And those keywords, they help me bounce to an idea and come back to you. But at the end of the session, I have this maybe 20 keywords. And so the idea is that you have an AI who as the entire history of philosophy, which of course I don't know by heart, and based on these 20 keywords, you go home with a tailored citation that the AI came up. This is doable. Actually, I do it with, with ChatGPT, uh, so you can do it today. That was just an anecdote, but I think it's, it's important to see that technology is there, and that does, it's not incompatible with a philosophically uh, healthy uh, world. The next chapter by Brendan Moran is on decolonization. Decolonization as philosophical health. Uh, and uh, the, the very related uh, chapter that follows by Jacob Vangus is on philosophical health in entangled cosmopolitan post-humanism with this questions of, okay, so uh, we are universalism, for example, we, we tap into it a bit earlier. Two last chapters of this part, uh, one on East Asian somatic philosophies as guides to a philosophically healthy life uh, by Lehel Balog, especially on the notion of key energy, that this sort of creative energy that is important is in uh, uh, some Chinese traditions, also Japanese traditions, right, where they had this uh, idea that the, uh, the creative force of the universe, they enter through us by the stomach, which relates very much to what people are rediscovering today about the, the importance of the, the gut um, and the bacteria, even for the way we think, the way we feel. And you've all heard about Harakiri, right? Um, well, Harakiri is, Hara is this zone, so Harakiri is precisely you cut the transmission with the universe that you have at, at this uh, at this level. The last chapter is uh, a, a chapter I wrote on philosophical health, creolectics, and the sense of the possible. So creolectics is the, my uh, method and approach and, and um, ontology for the way I do philosophical health. Basically, it's based on this idea of the possible and the compossible, um, and how we bring forth wor worlds uh, differently when we care for the whole. This ends with a methodological epilogue on the uh, SMILE method I told you about. So I think that it's exactly seven and I will now perhaps pause such that we um, are allowed to have a conversation. Hopefully uh, some of you have comments, questions. Please, I'm all ears. Thank you.
My condolences. <laughs> right. I think it's uh, very clear. So the, the the philosophy courses you took allow you to to explain things. I I, I couldn't say it better. I think that clarification of our concepts is an important part, but it's just a part. And that the way I see philosophy, that it was a mutation. If we want to if if we want to use a Darwinian language, I think philosophy is a very 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 recent mutation of the human species, where we suddenly uh, think uh, in concepts. And, uh, and so it's too new to know what it can do. But uh, I, do, I do believe that it, it has both a, a political uh, preoccupation, which was already there with Plato when he wrote The Republic, uh, and he wanted also, and I think philosophers wanted to uh, separate themselves from religions. There's this simple idea, perhaps too simple, but still it's helpful to say, okay, so religions, they promise paradise after we die. Philosophy is very concerned with paradise on earth. Uh, and that's what the Republic of Plato is about. Uh, but it's also about uh, how do we care about uh, the way we view the world, but also the implication it has on, on, on our embodiment, right? Because we take decisions all the time that are based on beliefs. Some of these decisions, they include habits that end up being uh, nefarious for the body. So all this is, is interrelated. So I do believe that the reason why uh, analytic philosophy existed, it's in fact, I would say, uh, very human, is that these philosophers, they wanted a position. And when you have a world in which uh, the measuring paradigm is so successful, uh, the, the paradigm of the sciences, it seemed to some philosophers uh, more safe to present philosophy as close as possible to a science in order to keep their job or to get a job. Uh, and because, well, uh, unfortunately, the kind of speculation that I think is very healthy that philosophy is sometimes associated with is considered to be uh, improductive in bringing people to the job market, for example. Uh, I think that's unfair because there is a moment, for example, um, I have done interventions uh, with corporations, uh, engineers, and, and it works very well to help them realize that, yes, there might be a way of doing things that takes more into consideration not only achieving that particular machine that they want to produce, but also see how is that going to integrate in society, in life. And you know why they understand that? Because if you take, for example, uh, a company, uh, like energy uh, companies uh, that I work with, 70% of the projects fail 
not because the technology doesn't work, but because society refuses it. So, and that's, the, that's true in many fields. So, uh, if you have only a technological approach, you're going to end up with 70% of what you do that is not implemented. And then, of course, in the 30% that remains implemented, you, that doesn't mean this is good, right? But uh, so it's, it's a network of decisions. And understanding how people think can be a way also to bring forth some, this is a very you know, Nordic word, consensus. But real consensus, deep consensus, not the kind of consensus that people sometimes, you know, they have one hour of meeting disagreeing and then in the end they're too tired. And they say, okay, uh, let's go with, with what the boss says. Or so, yeah, politics of academia have privileged uh, analytic philosophy, but this might change, you know, history goes in, in, uh, in circles. And I, I mean, I, I do think it's kind of important to develop a, a uh, healthy analytic intelligence, but that's not the only thing we need. We'll have that specialist conversation, but I want to, to make sure everyone is is allowed to speak. Uh, you, you want to, I don't know who raised their hand first. Yeah, I'll let you organize it. Oh yes, continuing with the discussion we had on the creativity of potential, AI capacity. for uh, artificial intelligence. Well, there's a very nice metaphor um, at the moment uh, online. You know uh, the company OpenAI. And they came up with a new product it's called Sora. And everybody's getting very fascinated, uh, almost hysterical about it, because it's a text-to-video AI. So you, you describe something and suddenly you have the film in front of you. But what I find very metaphorical is that, uh, uh, so at, at the moment uh, we cannot, the, the, the public cannot do it, but they posted some videos that they've done internally. And most of the videos is like, you know, kind of special effects, blah, blah. It's, it's meaningless, but it's very nice. It's, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, good dis in Swedish, uh, candy for the eyes. But uh, there is one video where the prompt is show us a French philosopher in a cafe thinking deep and discovering the ultimate meaning of the universe and, and realizing what truth is. That's the prompt. And in the video, you get a guy with a barrette in a cafe. And I think he's waiting for his duck. Uh, he's really hungry. I mean, it could be anything, right? I think that's the right metaphor uh, for, for AI. Uh, I, I think it's a great tool, but it's not going to do the, uh, the hard, creative, deep thinking that even us women's, uh, humans find it hard to, uh, find it hard to do. So I, there it's, it's an interesting moment that allows us to see that analytics is not the only uh, approach. Also, because I don't know if you, some of you read uh, the, mi the, um, the myth of Merlin. Well, there are different versions, but um, I think there is one by um, Boron. Or Bo anyway, the English version where Merlin is, as you know, Merlin is uh, the son of God and the devil. That's a lot of uh, things to carry. But, and so from the devil, 
he got the knowledge of the past, the book says. And from God he gets the knowledge of the future. But what does AI do? Is that it predicts the future based on the novel of the past. So if you transpose that into this medieval wisdom, you get AI equal the devil. But uh, more, uh, more seriously, coming back to creation, in my view, creation is not something that we humans have the monopoly of. I think uh, I, I'm a process philosopher. I think life is, is creating all the time. The universe is creating all the time. And most of these infinite uh, possibilities that are there are there as potential. They're not actualized. What we do in our world is we, we actualize certain possibles instead of others. And then we call ourselves very proudly creators, but we are just curators, I think. Uh, so that's why AI, generative AI, uh, can do amazing things. But so can uh, Peacock. So can evolution. That's, that's the ground of life. It's creating everywhere. That's not a problem. What is the problem is, how do we give meaning to that? How do we make worlds that are compossible in which the capacity for everyone to have a high sense of the possible is maximized? So I'm not anti-AI, but I'm, I don't see what's the, it's the big, uh, the big. I see, for example, that there will be strong, strong challenge to philosophical health in the use of VR because that could be escapism. And we already, if you take the effect on, of television plus cinema plus now, um, this sort of constant entertainment, Netflix, if you take the effect of that on some people combined to loneliness, for example, if you add uh, uh, VR, which would be extremely immersive, very convincing, uh, that's not going to be very good for well-belonging, perhaps. But perhaps we'll invent, um, we will, of course, we will negotiate dialectically with that. Someone else? Yeah. Yes. Do you know that joke? Uh, can I add a footnote on that? Because I'm actually starting oh, a conversation. Well, yes, yes. We, uh, for example, there's a nursing crisis in yeah. Finland yeah. arriving, but it's all over the world. And, uh, and I think, yeah, we could redefine some professions in terms of philosophical health. But yeah. go ahead. Right. Yeah, but then uh, about philosophy, uh, when I was young, uh, I wanted to know the meaning of life. So that's why I went to some philosophy lab or whatever. Uh, I was quite disappointed because it didn't tell me what the meaning of life was. Mm -hmm. Brush out all the 
Yeah, I mean, that's this distinction between an active person and a reactive person is, is essential. Since Nietzsche, that's uh, one of the fathers of the existentialism. And the fact that, yes, we, we tend sometimes to have a sort of, um, well, what I was talking about, choice, this sort of supermarket view on meaning, right? Um, we, 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 by the way, um, the meaning of life is on page 142. <laughs> <laughs> It's of course my <laughs> chapter, uh, but um, so I, I there is in my uh, counseling I use a lot the concept of bad faith for starter, right? Which you know, but this idea for those who have uh, less heard of it is the idea that we tend to blame the past or the others or things that we've done, etc., for where we are now. But what existentialism say? Well, w where we are now, it's it starts anew. So we. If you're blaming anything in the past, that's bad faith. What we need is a leap of faith. And what you're saying about how we, we learn to read, because this is a little bit what I heard in what you said, is that it's true that I remember also was if, you read, uh, if you read David Hume when you're 18, you think, but this is so lame or and then you read it again 40 years later from your perspective and suddenly you you see amazing things because of course if you don't have yourself a lens it's like you interpret things with the kind of ideology of your time and uh, there was a time where I stopped reading philosophy for two three years I was writing novels I was reading more novels uh, and uh, and one day, and I had, I, I had was working as a journalist, uh, and one day I went uh, for lunch alone, and for some reason I had an article uh, on Hegel. And I, I remember I was having pizza. I don't know if that m means anything, but uh, maybe the pizza had onion. Why? Because I, I started reading this article on Hegel, and I started crying. And I realized how much I missed philosophy and how important it was in my life. I quit my job as a journalist a few weeks uh, later, became unemployed. I wrote my first philosophical essay. So, uh, and I think with Hegel, by the way, I am still in that discovering faith, right? Because Hegel is such a, a mountain, right? So it's like every decade you, right? Perhaps you, have, you enter into Hegel and go, wow, and then. Perhaps uh, there's an age for ego, 80 years old, I don't know. But uh, so, yes, um, the, um, I think the, the importance of realizing also that there is no age, for philosophy, there's no such thing as being old. And especially today, we'll probably all live to 100, all of us, so we might, uh, start thinking what to do when we're forced into retirement. Buy this book <laughs> and you will know.
Yeah. And it's not. Mm. Uh, I was wondering how philosophical, philosophical chemistry helps. Exactly. And, uh, and we know, I mean, for those of you who've had children, we know how much anxiety it is when you give them too much choice. Right? Uh, so the first question, yes, certainly, uh, that's part of the ri rhetoric, is that I do, I don't want to argue that it's more important, or perhaps I do, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at least equally important, yes. And, and of course, in ways that do not separate the three, but actually, Sort of rediscover that they are perspectives, perhaps on the same on the same uh, experience. Um, choice, you know, I, I I do see some. So it's interesting because that relates to that distinction between the potential and and the actual, right? We are creatures grounded in potential. And existentially, what it means is that some people think, well, as long as I don't actualize, I'm a genius, <laughs> right? I, I am a great novelist because I haven't written any novel. I am a great philosopher because I have not yet, but potentially, ooh, and I see a lot of people like that. And even 40, they, they sort of uh, indulge in potentiality. And this is favored by uh, the spirit of capitalism, who is extremely good at proposing paid solutions for that, for, your, for our procrastination, right? Oh, on Monday you can take a guitar course, on Tuesday you can take a yoga course, uh, where it's important is to fragment, so that you never really become a, a guitarist or a yoga master, etc., because then, uh, then you might realize, well, I don't need to pay for this thing. But so, so indeed, so there is, uh, I think, I mean, where until, until my 30s, I was very much engaged in politics, and I still am anti-capitalist, but in ways that are perhaps less confrontational, but that's, you know, the old cliche as we get old, perhaps. But I do think that um, philosophical health is a political tool in terms that it, it, it is about world forming. How do we, what do we actualize? And, and of course, today, we need to actualize worlds that do uh, more with less. So, just to finish on choice, when I was 16, I went with a grant to uh, Africa Guinea-Bissau, one of the, s the poorest countries uh, at, at that time, still today, I suppose. And it was a Marxist, actually, regime. And I went there simply because my mother was teaching there when she was pregnant, and I'm her lonely child, so I was kind of there. Uh, and I went there with a grant to reflect on post-colonialism. And I was only 16, and I spent one month there alone, and it was really hard. But, it was a, a culture shock that I think is at the base of my decision to, to write books, for example, try to understand the world with books, because the rhythm, just the existential rhythm in Africa, and, and everything was so different, but just that, the relationship even to space and time, uh, was so different that when I came back to Paris, where I live, I remember standing in a supermarket uh, in a stupor, to the fact that we had 10 different kinds of toothpaste. And I know that this is something people say, right? Yeah, that, but it was deeper in me. It was like, I, I was really like, this is over. I'm, I'm done. I'm not part of this world anymore. So, and the rest of the story is a sort of reconstruction of how to live in the Western world uh, when we dis discover much more uh, minimalist uh, way of, of living, and I'm not romanticizing. Uh, they, they, you know, they probably wish to have ten toothpaste, but I mean, uh, the so, so I think yes, I think there is a um, an idea of in compossibility. There is this idea that when you optimize a set, you it's not that you're going to maximize every point. So, uh, and that's how we, it's very difficult for capitalist uh, individuals to think like that. 
everyone wants to maximize themselves. And of course, this creates chaos. So if you have a composable set, it's, it's well, none of the points is usually at the maximum. And first of all, it's, it's moving all the time. So Leibniz would consider capitalism to be a total aberration uh, in terms of even systems thinking. But I think it's a, it's a good conclusion because here you, you can think like an existentialist, which you sort of suggested before that you were attracted. An existentialist would say, no, the choices are infinite. So there's a difference between existential choices and supermarket choice. So in, in Russia, there might be less supermarket choices, but they, are, they have as much possibles than we have and uh, and uh, and they will prove it soon in a way or another because that's history it, it, it goes it goes around uh, it's this dif difference between what is available in terms of choices and what we can manifest from the invisible Perhaps we can conclude on, on those words. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if some of you are um so for beer and uh, so uh, you know, uh, yeah, you're attracted or please uh, feel free to join me. I am also